Good to be true news. Welcome to our Friday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. Today, I am continuing a series that I started two weeks ago talking about the war is over. And that may sound like a strange title to you, but I base this on uh, Luke chapter 2, verse 14, where the angels were singing at the birth of Jesus, and they said, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill towards men. That's not talking about peace among men, but peace from God prior to the birth of Jesus and then His crucifixion and resurrection, there was war between God and man because of sin. We had transgressed against God. And the Lord said that in the day you eat of the tree, you shall die. They didn't physically die that day, but they spiritually died. They were separated from God and eventually physical death was an end result of that. But there was a separation between God and man because of sin. And it continued through the Old Testament. But when Jesus came and He died for our sins, it ended the war. The war is over. And that's what I've been talking about. And some people think that when I say things like this and I'm saying that God is not imputing sin unto us and many of the things that I've said, some people think, well, you're just making light of sin. No, I'm not making light of sin. I believe sin is terrible. I believe that sin is deadly. I hate sin probably more than most people do. I'm not making light of sin. What I'm doing is magnifying the atonement of Jesus. And I could say it this way, that people who are saying, oh yeah, Jesus died for your sins, but if you sin, God is going to get you. God will not answer your prayer. God is going to punish you. God won't fellowship with you. What you are doing is making light of Jesus' atonement. You think that what Jesus did wasn't enough, that it's only a basis, it's a foundation, and then we've got to add to it our goodness. No, I'm, I'm not making light of sin. I am just magnifying the atonement of Jesus. And we went through Isaiah chapter 52, 53, and 54 and tried to magnify the atonement that Jesus made for us and make it so big that it's not, sin is not unimportant. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that this sacrifice that was given for our sin paid more than we could ever owe. From now until the time we go to be with the Lord, our sins, past, present, and even future, have all been atoned for. They've been paid for. And I am not uh, diminishing sin. I am magnifying the payment for our sin. So when a person sits there and says, Oh yeah, Jesus died for you, but you also have to do this or God won't bless you. What you are doing is making light of Jesus. It's just like a slap in the face. It's like you're saying, Jesus... I APPRECIATE WHAT YOU DID, BUT IT'S NOT ENOUGH. I'M GOING TO ADD TO IT. AND WITH MY HELP, I WILL MAKE IT TO GOD, AND GOD WILL ANSWER MY PRAYERS. BUT WHAT YOU DID WASN'T ENOUGH. I ALSO HAVE TO ADD TO IT. MAN, THAT'S WRONG. YOU KNOW, WHEN YOU PRAY AND SAY, IN THE NAME OF JESUS, THAT DOESN'T MEAN THAT THIS IS THE CLOSE OF YOUR PRAYER. AMEN. We, we always put it, you know, at the end of our prayer, and it's become a religious cliche, and people don't know what it means, but it means that you are claiming that your only righteousness, the only reason you expect to get your prayer answered is because of Jesus. He gave you His name. You could approach God the Father and say, because of Jesus, because of what He did, I expect to receive. That's what in the name of Jesus means. But if a person is praying, oh God, I've gone to church, I've paid my tithes, I'm living holy, I'm doing the best I can, please move in my life in Jesus' name. AMEN. YOU'VE JUST TAKEN THE NAME OF JESUS IN VAIN BECAUSE YOU WEREN'T REALLY APPROACHING GOD ON THE BASIS OF WHAT JESUS DID. YOU MENTIONED ALL OF THE THINGS THAT YOU'VE BEEN DOING. GOD, I DID THIS, THIS, AND THIS. AND SO YOU ARE USING THE NAME OF JESUS IN VAIN. YOU AREN'T REALLY TRUSTING WHAT HE'S DONE. YOU'RE TRUSTING WHAT YOU HAVE DONE FOR JESUS. I HAVE HAD MANY, MANY, MANY PEOPLE COME TO ME AND THEY SAY, WHY HASN'T GOD HEALED ME? AND THEN THEY COMMENCE TO TELL ME ALL THE THINGS THAT THEY'VE DONE. I GO TO CHURCH. I STUDY THE WORD. I PAY MY tithes, I'M LIVING HOLY. I DO THIS, THIS, AND THIS. WHY HASN'T GOD HEALED ME? YOU'VE TOLD ME IN THAT STATEMENT BECAUSE YOU DIDN'T POINT TO WHAT JESUS DID FOR YOU. YOU'VE POINTED TO WHAT YOU HAVE DONE FOR HIM. IT'S NOT WHAT YOU DO FOR HIM. IT'S WHAT HE HAS DONE FOR YOU. AND YOU JUST HAVE TO HUMBLE YOURSELF AND RECEIVE IT BY FAITH. 
Did you know people who are really into living holy and that they have lived a really holy life, it's hard for them to let go of their goodness because they are comparing themselves with other people. You know, the Bible says, I think it's 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12, that they comparing themselves among themselves and measuring themselves by themselves are not wise. And there are people that do this. And you may come out on the good end of the stick. You may look good compared to me or compared to somebody else, but we aren't your standard. The Bible says in Romans 3, 23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's Jesus. You aren't... It's wrong for you to compare yourself with me and say, well, I'm better than Andrew Womack or I'm better than somebody over here. I'm better than this publican. I fast twice in the week. I pay tithes of mint and anise and cumin. That guy was living a holier life outwardly, but the problem was that Pharisee was trusting in his goodness and Jesus said he was rejected by God. But the man who was such a sinner over here, he was a publican. He was, a, he was stealing money from his own people. He was a traitor to the Jewish nation. He collaborated with the Roman government. He was a thief and taxed the people more than they were worth. He was doing everything that was wrong, but because he humbled himself and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Jesus said he went down to his house justified. The man who was living a holier life was rejected. People who live a holy life, it's hard for them to humble themselves because they, they feel like all of this holiness, all of this self-denial, all of this good living that I've done, it hasn't made me any better than anybody else. That's exactly what I'm saying. Who wants to be the best sinner that ever went to hell? All of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You may be a better sinner than I am, but you are a sinner and you need a Savior. And if you are going to trust in yourself, you will miss heaven. You will miss relationship with God. Even after you're born again, there's a lot of people who get born again and they trust God for their eternal salvation, but on a day-to-day -day basis, they try and earn God's favor. And they do all of these things thinking, God, now you've got to move in my life because I've lived holy. That is not true. This is all of the stuff that I've been talking about. And yesterday I was talking about in Ephesians chapter 6 and in verse 15, you have to have your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. This is what the angels were proclaiming at the birth of Jesus. Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill, the good news. They were praising God for the good news, the nearly too good to be true news that there was now peace between God and man. Over in Romans chapter 5, I read this verse yesterday. Therefore, being justified by faith, not by performance, not by your holiness, but being justified by faith, we have peace with God. The only way you will ever have peace with God is through faith. If you base your peace upon your goodness, you might do okay for a brief period of time, but I can guarantee you, you will fail. You will mess up. And when you do, it's like building a house of cards. One thing falls, the whole thing falls. And the, and the moment you base your relationship with God on your goodness, you are going to mess up. And then all of this guilt and all of this condemnation will come crashing down upon you and you'll feel so rejected by God. And it's because you were basing it upon yourself and you just aren't perfect. You may be good for a period of time, but you will mess up. If you hadn't messed up today, just wait. You will. Amen. You will fail. And even if you don't go out and violate a direct command like thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, you will violate some of the commands of God where it says to him that knows to do good and does it not to him it is sin. Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. And I can guarantee you there's going to be something that will happen today or tomorrow that you didn't respond in faith the way that you should. We just aren't perfect. You may not always break a direct commandment, but you will always fall short of being a perfect person. And if you think that you have to earn relationship with God, there will never be peace. Even if today you were doing everything perfectly, you got to get up and do it again tomorrow and there will be no peace. There will be no rest. The only way you ever have peace with God is when you quit trusting in yourself and quit thinking that you have to earn the blessing of God and you just rest in what Jesus did. 
BECAUSE THE BIBLE SAYS IN HEBREWS 13 THAT JESUS IS THE SAME YESTERDAY, TODAY, AND FOREVER. HE NEVER CHANGES. HE'S GOING TO BE FAITHFUL TOMORROW JUST LIKE HE WAS FAITHFUL TODAY. HE'LL BE FAITHFUL A YEAR FROM NOW, A HUNDRED YEARS FROM NOW. THE ONLY WAY YOU WILL EVER HAVE PEACE WHERE YOU CAN REST IS WHEN YOU START TRUSTING WHAT JESUS HAS DONE FOR YOU AND NOT WHAT YOU DO FOR HIM. THAT IS THE GOSPEL OF PEACE. THIS IS THE POWER OF GOD. ROMANS 1, 16, THE GOSPEL IS THE POWER OF GOD UNTO SALVATION. AND GOSPEL ISN'T REFERRING TO SO MANY THINGS THAT PEOPLE TODAY CALL THE GOSPEL. IT'S SPECIFICALLY TALKING ABOUT THE NEARLY TOO GOOD TO BE TRUE NEWS THAT GOD LOVES YOU IN SPITE OF WHO YOU ARE, NOT BECAUSE OF WHO YOU ARE. GOD LOVES YOU BECAUSE HE IS LOVELY, NOT BECAUSE YOU ARE LOVELY. GOD LOVES YOU BECAUSE HE HAS PUT ALL OF YOUR SIN UPON JESUS AND IF YOU ACCEPT HIM AS YOUR SAVIOR, THEN HE LOVES YOU BECAUSE YOU PUT FAITH IN HIM, EVEN THOUGH YOU STILL AREN'T PERFORMING RIGHT. THAT'S THE ONLY WAY THAT YOU WILL EVER HAVE PEACE WITH GOD. MAN, THAT IS THE GOSPEL OF PEACE WHICH WE ARE SUPPOSED TO BE PREACHING. LET ME TURN OVER HERE TO ROMANS CHAPTER 6, AND I'VE MENTIONED THIS A NUMBER OF TIMES, BUT I WANT TO SPEND THE REST OF TODAY'S PROGRAM TRYING TO MAKE THIS POINT. PAUL HAD PREACHED IN ROMANS 1 THROUGH 5 ABOUT THE GRACE OF GOD AND THAT IT'S ONLY WHAT GOD DID FOR US. AND I JUST QUOTED ALL OF THESE VERSES. WE HAVE ACCESS BY FAITH INTO THIS GRACE. IT'S ONLY BEING JUSTIFIED BY FAITH THAT WE HAVE PEACE WITH GOD. THAT'S ROMANS CHAPTER 5, VERSES 1 AND 2. AND HE HAD JUST SAID ALL OF THESE THINGS. AND BECAUSE HE WAS TRYING TO SHOW THAT IT'S NOT YOUR PERFORMANCE THAT MAKES GOD LOVE YOU. WELL, THEN THE QUESTION JUST AUTOMATICALLY ARISES IN ROMANS CHAPTER 6, VERSE 1. WHAT SHALL WE SAY THEN? SHALL WE CONTINUE IN SIN THAT GRACE MAY ABOUND? AND THE ANSWER TO THIS IS IN VERSE 2. GOD FORBID. AND IN THE GREEK LANGUAGE, THIS IS AS CLOSE AS YOU CAN COME TO CURSING WITHOUT CURSING. IT IS AN ABSOLUTE, UNQUALIFIED, NEGATIVE, ABSOLUTELY NOT, NO WAY, JOSE, THIS IS NOT WHAT I AM SAYING. BUT BEFORE I GET INTO THIS, LET ME JUST SAY THAT AFTER PAUL HAD PREACHED ON GRACE, THE QUESTION CAME UP, CAN WE CONTINUE IN SIN THAT GRACE MAY ABOUND? HE HAS THAT QUESTION TWICE HERE IN THE SIXTH CHAPTER. AND THEN ALSO IN THE BOOK OF GALATIANS, HE DEALS WITH IT TWICE. SO FOUR TIMES IN THE WRITINGS OF PAUL, THIS QUESTION CAME UP ABOUT, CAN I JUST GO LIVE IN SIN BECAUSE OF GRACE, BECAUSE OF GOD'S GRACE? ABSOLUTELY NOT. AND HERE IN ROMANS, IT GIVES YOU TWO REASONS. FIRST OF ALL, LET ME SAY THIS. IF THIS QUESTION NEVER COMES UP, WHEN YOU GO TO CHURCH AND YOU HEAR PEOPLE TALK ABOUT THE QUOTE UNQUOTE GOSPEL, AND IF WHAT THEY'RE SAYING TO THE GOSPEL IS YOU GOT TO COME TO CHURCH, YOU GOT TO LIVE HOLY, YOU GOT TO PAY YOUR tithes, YOU GOT TO DO THIS AND THIS AND THIS BEFORE GOD WILL DO THAT, AND THEY'RE CALLING THAT THE GOSPEL, WELL, THEN YOU'LL NEVER HAVE THIS QUESTION COME UP. BUT IF YOU PREACH THE TRUE GOSPEL, EVERY TIME PEOPLE WILL SAY, ARE YOU JUST ENCOURAGING PEOPLE TO SIN? ARE YOU SAYING IT'S OKAY FOR US TO LIVE IN SIN? NO, THAT'S NOT WHAT I'M SAYING. BUT IF THAT QUESTION NEVER COMES UP, THEN YOU AREN'T PREACHING THE SAME GOSPEL THAT PAUL PREACHED, BECAUSE HE HAD TO ANSWER IT FOUR TIMES IN THE SCRIPTURES THAT HE WROTE. MAN, THAT'S QUITE AN INDICTMENT RIGHT THERE. THERE'S SOME OF YOU WATCHING THIS PROGRAM THAT YOU'VE BEEN GOING TO CHURCH FOR 20 YEARS. AND YOU'VE NEVER HAD THIS QUESTION COME UP. ARE THEY JUST SAYING THAT I COULD GO LIVE IN SIN BECAUSE OF GOD'S GRACE? NO, THAT QUESTION HAS NEVER COME UP BECAUSE THEY AREN'T PREACHING THE SAME GOSPEL. THEY'RE PREACHING A PERFORMANCE-BASED GOSPEL, A SELF-RIGHTEOUSNESS GOSPEL. AND THAT'S NOT A GOSPEL AT ALL. THAT'S BAD NEWS. ANYTIME IT'S RELATED TO YOU, IT'S LINKED TO YOU, IT'S BAD NEWS. IT'S ONLY WHEN YOU PUT FAITH IN JESUS THAT YOU CAN HAVE PEACE. SO HE SAYS, SHALL WE CONTINUE IN SIN THAT GRACE MAY ABOUND? GOD FORBID. HERE'S THE FIRST REASON HE GIVES. HOW SHALL WE THAT ARE DEAD TO SIN LIVE ANY LONGER THEREIN? AND I COULD LITERALLY SPEND WEEKS ON THIS. I'M JUST GOING THROUGH THIS VERY QUICKLY. BUT WHEN YOU GOT BORN AGAIN, YOUR NATURE CHANGED. AND THE REST OF THESE VERSES ARE SAYING THAT YOU DO NOT HAVE A SINFUL NATURE ANYMORE. WHEN YOU GET BORN AGAIN, WE WERE ALL BORN WITH A SINFUL NATURE. WE WERE ALL BY NATURE THE CHILDREN OF WRATH, IS WHAT IT SAYS IN EPHESIANS CHAPTER 2. AND SO WE WERE SEPARATED FROM GOD AT ONE TIME. EVERY PERSON WATCHING THIS PROGRAM HAD A SINFUL NATURE. BUT IF YOU ACCEPTED THE SALVATION THAT IS OFFERED THROUGH JESUS, IF YOU PUT FAITH IN WHAT HE HAS DONE FOR YOU, 
you were born again and you were your nature changed. Your old sinful nature was taken out. It is dead. It is gone. It is non-existent. You now have a new nature. And so the number one reason that people that are born again don't go live in sin just because God loves them by grace is because your heart's been changed and you don't want to live in sin. And if you are listening to me and you're saying, well, man, I'd love to go live in sin. I'd love to just forsake my mate and go marry this person over there. I know it's wrong, but that's what I want to do. And you are saying, I'm going to do it. I'm going to take your teaching on grace, and I think I'll just divorce and go get me somebody else. Well, then you never were changed. Your heart's not changed. You may go to church. You may call yourself a Christian, but you aren't truly born again if you just want to go rebel at God and live in sin. The truth is, if you are born again, you are dead unto sin. And I know that there are some people watching this program right now saying, well, man, I know I'm born again, and yet I still have a desire for somebody else's mate, or I still desire to do things that are wrong. What's wrong with me? Well, you know, it's similar to, I, I dress myself today. Nobody else dressed me, but I remember when I was a little kid, I don't know if everybody had this, but I used to have struggled to get my shirt button correctly. I'd never get the right button in the right hole. And I remember, I was old enough to remember my dad sitting me down, and he says, you are going to learn how to button your shirt. And so anyway, he, he just helped me to get it so that I buttoned my shirt. And you know what? Nobody else dressed me, so I know that I buttoned this shirt, but I don't even remember doing it. It's just like it's my nature. You could say that it just, I did it without even thinking. It was my nature, but it's not my nature because I remember when I was young, I couldn't do this. It's an acquired trait, but you can program yourself. You can repeat an action over and over and over so many times that it's like it becomes your nature. So the reason I say all of this is some of you are thinking, well, man, you're saying that if you're truly born again, you're dead to sin. I'm not dead to sin. I can still go out and sin. Your mind was programmed how to be selfish, how to lust, how to do things like this. And when you get born again, your spirit's changed, but your mind's not instantly changed. You have to reprogram your mind. Romans chapter 12, verse 2 says, Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You've got to reprogram your mind. It's through transforming yourself by the renewing of your mind that the life that is in your spirit begins to start dominating your soul and then eventually come out through your body. But what I'm saying is that it's a habit. It's the way you were taught that causes you to still have a propensity for sin. Your spirit has been changed. If you are born again at the heart level, you don't want to live in sin. You want to live for God. You want to be free from sin. Now, you may not know the truth. Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free, John 8:32. And if you don't know the truth, you could still be in bondage. Like, you know, this example I gave last week about the Japanese soldier who was, went to Lubang, an island in the Philippines, and he uh, kept fighting the World War II for 29 years after World War II was over because he didn't know the truth. And there are Christians that are still not knowing the truth. They haven't heard the truth. They go to church, but they aren't hearing the gospel of peace. They aren't hearing that the war is over. They are hearing that you've got to earn things, and because of it, you just aren't experiencing the goodness of God. And so your spirit, if you are born again, your spirit has been changed, but your mind has to get into agreement. It's the spirit and soul together. Your heart combination the heart is the spirit and soul together, and you believe with all of your heart is when you begin to start seeing things happen. So that's the first reason that it gives here in Romans chapter 6, and it says in verse 13, it says, Neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. See here, he's talking about the grace of God, and he had preached it so strong that people said, can we just go live in sin because of God's grace? 
NO, THAT'S NOT WHAT HE'S SAYING. AND RIGHT HERE HE'S TELLING YOU, DON'T YIELD YOURSELF TO SIN. YIELD YOURSELF TO GOD AS MEMBERS OF RIGHTEOUSNESS. AND THEN IN VERSE 14, FOR SIN SHALL NOT HAVE DOMINION OVER YOU, FOR YOU ARE NOT UNDER THE LAW, BUT UNDER GRACE. GRACE BREAKS THE DOMINION OF SIN. THERE ARE SOME PEOPLE TEACHING QUOTE UNQUOTE GRACE AND SAYING, MAN, THIS IS FREEDOM TO GO LIVE IN SIN. YOU KNOW, A FRIEND OF MINE, JESSE DEPLANIS, ACTUALLY SAID THAT HE WENT TO A CHURCH AND NOT LONG AFTER HE CHECKED INTO HIS HOTEL ROOM, TWO WOMEN CAME AND KNOCKED ON THE DOOR AND HE ASKED THEM WHAT THEY WANTED AND THEY SAID, OH, THEY WERE THERE TO MINISTER TO HIM. AND THEY WERE PROSTITUTES THAT THE CHURCH SENT TO HAVE SEXUAL RELATIONSHIPS WITH HIM BECAUSE THEY WERE GRACE PEOPLE. NOW THAT IS PERVERSE. THAT'S WRONG. THAT'S NOT YIELDING YOURSELF. THIS SAYS SIN WILL NOT HAVE DOMINION. SO PEOPLE WHO PREACH GRACE AND THEREFORE INDULGE THEMSELVES IN PROSTITUTION, INDULGE THEMSELVES IN DRINKING, GETTING DRUNK, DOING DRUGS, YOU KNOW, WHATEVER IT IS, AND THEY SAY THAT IT'S BECAUSE OF THE GRACE OF GOD. THAT'S NOT THE GRACE OF GOD. THE GRACE OF GOD WILL BREAK THE DOMINION OF SIN. IT DOESN'T SET YOU FREE TO SIN. IN VERSE 15, HE SAYS, WHAT THEN? SHALL WE SIN BECAUSE WE ARE NOT UNDER THE LAW BUT UNDER GRACE? GOD FORBID. THIS IS THE SECOND TIME IN THE SAME CHAPTER HE ASKED THIS SAME THING. AND THEN HE SAYS IN VERSE 16, KNOW YE NOT THAT TO WHOM YE YIELD YOURSELVES SERVANTS TO OBEY, HIS SERVANTS YE ARE TO WHOM YE OBEY, WHETHER OF SIN UNTO DEATH OR OF OBEDIENCE UNTO RIGHTEOUSNESS. SO THE SECOND REASON HE GIVES HERE IS THAT IF YOU GO OUT AND LIVE IN SIN, YOU YIELD YOURSELF TO THE AUTHOR OF THAT SIN, WHICH IS THE DEVIL, JOHN 10:10 10, 10 SAYS, THE THIEF COMES ONLY TO STEAL, KILL, AND TO DESTROY, BUT I AM COME THAT YOU MIGHT HAVE LIFE AND HAVE IT MORE ABUNDANTLY. IF YOU YIELD YOURSELF TO SATAN, SATAN IS GOING TO DESTROY YOU. YOU BECOME HIS SERVANT, AND HE'S ONLY OUT TO SEEK WHOM HE MAY DEVOUR. HE WANTS TO DEVOUR. HE WANTS TO DESTROY YOUR LIFE. AND THERE ARE CHRISTIANS, PEOPLE WHO REALLY HAVE PUT FAITH IN JESUS. YOUR HEART HAS BEEN CHANGED. BUT YOU ARE OUT LIVING IN SIN, AND BECAUSE OF IT, YOU'RE MISERABLE. SATAN IS DESTROYING YOUR MARRIAGE. HE'S DESTROYING YOUR HEALTH. HE'S DESTROYING YOUR FINANCES. YOU DON'T HAVE ANY JOY, AND YOU DON'T HAVE ANY PEACE, AND YOU THINK GOD IS THE ONE WHO'S PUNISHING YOU. know, GOD HAS A COVENANT OF PEACE, THE GOSPEL OF PEACE. HE'S NEVER GOING TO BE ANGRY AT YOU. GOD'S NOT UPSET, BUT YOU ARE JUST COOPERATING. YOU ARE HELPING THE DEVIL DESTROY YOUR LIFE. AND SO YOU NEED TO RUN BACK TO GOD, EVEN IN THE MIDST OF YOUR SIN, KNOWING THAT HE'S NOT GOING TO REJECT YOU, AND YOU NEED TO LET HIS GRACE BREAK THE DOMINION OF SIN, AND THEN YOU TURN AGAINST THAT SIN AND QUIT GIVING SATAN ALL OF THE AMMUNITION THAT HE'S USING TO SHOOT AT YOU. QUIT COOPERATING WITH HIM. YOU START LIVING A HOLY LIFE.